Good morning, everybody. Hello. drink together, there's kind of a, there's a sense of we're in unity. What's another reason why we sing? What's different about singing? Guy. Practicing for heaven. <laughs> I love it. Practicing for heaven. Yeah. Because in the scripture, we get a picture in, in heaven that uh, people are singing around the throne. Yep. What else do we do? Why, why do we sing? No one's texted me yet. Give me an idea. What happens in you? What's, what happens in you when you sing... Does something different happen in you when you're in church? It brings us joy. Okay. So there's something that's beautiful about music and beauty brings joy. Okay. What else? Sue? Brings us into the presence of God. Yeah. Yeah. And that may be not true for every one of us, but for a lot of us, music somehow connects a part of who we are in a way that just words on their own without the melody doesn't do. <clears throat> sort of engages something in our spirit. Do you think? Does that, mm. There's something about putting melody with words of truth that engages something deep in us. I really hope that that's what happens for you now. We're going to sing a couple of songs, an oldie and a newie. And what I hope and pray is that the singing will help you to engage with God, that the melody with words of truth will help to bring us together into the presence of God. Let's stand and sing. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise Him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. He is the Lord, forever His truth. Shall reign, heaven and earth rejoice in his holy name. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. He is exalted, the king is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted, forever exalted, and I will praise His name. Oh, He is the Lord, forever His truth shall reign. Heaven and earth rejoice in His holy The King is exalted on high. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. He is exalted. The King is exalted on high. Love the clapping. That's great. I've always wondered, can Epping Church of Christ clap? Well, some can and some can't. God is very forgiving, you know that. <laughs> Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for a narrow road that leads to life, but I want to be on it. It's a narrow road with a 
mercies wide Cause you're good in your promise I'll take you at your word If you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good it works If you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word Chaos fell in line I know Because I've seen it in my life It's a narrow road That leads to life But I want to be on it It's a narrow road And the tide is high But you're part of the water I'll take you at your word Oh, if you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good it works And if you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word Oh, if you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good it works If you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word You said your love will never give up You said your grace is always enough You said your heart would never forget or forsake me You said I'm saved, you call me yours You said my future's full of your hope You've never failed, so I know that you'll never fail me Will never give up You said your grace is always enough You said your heart would never forget or forsake me You said I'm safe, you call me yours You said my future's full of your hope You've never failed, so I know that you'll never fail me I'll take you at your word if you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good it works And if you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word oh, If you said it, I'll believe it I've seen how good it works And if you start it, you'll complete it I'll take you at your word <laughs> uh, let me just pray for us as we begin. Thank you, God, that you're in this place with us. Uh, God, we thank you that we can lay all of our worries from this week, all the worries that we've got going on next week, just aside and just invite you in here, God, because that's what we want, God. We just want to set this time aside for you, God. And um, yeah, we love that you're here and love that all the people are in the house as well. Amen. Take a seat if you haven't already. Welcome to church if you're in the house or if you're in your own house. Welcome to church as well. We've got a few announcements this morning. Um, we want to thank you to everyone for voting online for the rules of association changes. They have been accepted. Give a clap for that. That's good. That's good. The Hope Connect Food Bank. We have one more week to completely fill this table over here. Um, Justin's car is going to be pretty heavy because he's going to be taking all this food over to Hope Connect. So let's see if we can break the springs in his car, right? And fill it up. <laughs> it's going to be a full, full uh, car trip over to Tilopia. We're also welcoming uh, Karen Law Chung as part of the admin team with Wendy and Kathy. She's been learning the ropes. And Karen's been working on a new project, getting all of these new name tags made. So we can upgrade from this to this. <laughs> eh? <laughs> if you can see, that's my name tag over there. I'm Dan. I'm actually Dan Dan because I got two of them now. <laughs> The church camp is coming up. Time keeps ticking closer, so if you haven't already registered, please uh, register for the church camp. 
Um, if you just want to come along for the day, um, I think I might be doing that. Uh, definitely do that because I think it's worth us all connecting at church camp. Um, that's later this month. Hope Connect prayer meetings. We've got one on the 15th of May. Um, so that's in a couple of Wednesdays time. And start inviting your friends to the Alpha course. Uh, we're going to be doing an Alpha course here Sunday, uh, Sunday night, May 19th. So that's cool to be back at church at night. And if you're nervous about talking to your friends about Jesus, I think this is a really good way just to bring them along down the back and just have uh, other community members to help talk to them about Jesus as well. I think that's really awesome. And we do need some people to help cook for that as well. So if you're keen on cooking, being in the back, um, let's do that. We have an E3 night coming up. Now, I don't know if any, if there are any um, video games out there, but when I was growing up, E3 was this video game convention so that's not what this is. <laughs> uh, this is Equip, Empower, Encourage, Thursday night, the 16th of May. So uh, if you're a volunteer uh, or you're thinking about being a volunteer, please come along to this. Um, we're going to be doing dinner and some worship as well. The 9th of June at 5 p.m., we've got a worship night. That's good. Get, let's get another clap for that, right? Yeah. <laughs> Love the worship nights. It's going to be down in the back um, in June. Uh, so please come along to that double service that day. It's going to be good. And Coffee with the Pastor this Tuesday. Justin's going to be over at Darcy Street over that way. So if you um, don't want to work on Tuesday morning and hang out with Justin, <laughs> maybe get back to work after that. Um, but that, that'll be great. You can hang out with Justin. Uh, we do have a slide. Do we have a slide for offering? Uh, we got one up there. So um, let me just pray for the offering this morning. Hey, God, I thank you that you've given us, you've given us everything, God. You've given us our friends, our family, our church community. You've given us money. You've given us all, all the things um, that we have, especially in this amazing first world country, God. We just uh, pray that you'd be able to use these offerings for you, God. You pray that uh, you'd put on our hearts what we should give to you, God, because we have so much abundance, God. Um, yeah, God, we thank you for all the things that you give us. Um, pray all this in your name. Amen. I'm just going to call up Justin. Thank you. I just thought it might be easier if I jump up uh, and talk a little bit about, about announcements. Um, but before we do that, why don't we invite the kids to pop downstairs uh, since it's uh, kids this morning. So um, let me pray as they're heading downstairs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our young people and for the ministry um, to these young people. Please bless them and continue to disciple them, Lord Jesus. We also thank you for our young people who are serving in the service today. And, uh, yeah, we thank you that you love each and every one of them, Lord. Amen. Amen. Uh, just very quickly, uh, just to add on to the announcements, uh, there are a bunch of, like, meetings that happen on Sundays. Uh, there's a bunch of meetings today. Um, so there is like an admin meeting for those people who know that, that that's going to happen today. Um, so that admin will, let's try to squeeze that in. But then there's a think tank meeting that I'm going to, uh, I've asked a few people to come and be a part of. That's at 12.15, so I hadn't given a, a strict time. But if you could try to go off, grab some lunch, come back, have that together, and we'll try to kick that off at 12.15. I'm going to invite uh, Colin up, who also has an announcement. Thank you, Justin. Um, most of you, or all of you, should have received through the week on your uh, prayer request a special one for, for Jess, uh, who... Uh, yesterday she left, she and her family left to and for Singapore. And on Friday of this week through to Monday after, she'll be making a, a solo visit on her own to Brunei to speak in a network of underground churches who are students of the uh, uh, online Bible college. I've had it on my heart. to ask Justin if we could have a prayer meeting here in the church next Saturday, 10 o'clock, where we can cover Jess in prayer. She'll be in, in the country and she'll need prayer, let me tell you, because I had an experience of being in a small North Asian country and you go in there where the word Jesus, the word God is forbidden 
and you disappear. I've been there where I was, my room was bugged, audibly and visually. Um, I was with a small group of four, and I went into that country, and I came, I wanted to get out straight away. I just couldn't, but peace prevailed, and I stayed, and we fulfilled our commitment that we went there for. But I know it's like going into a country where they don't want you as a Christian. <coughs> and Jess will need this because she's going to be exposing herself but also exposing the students who are doing this course. So please come next Saturday morning, starting at 10 o'clock. If it's, I like to see if we can fill the church for people. It'll be microphones so you'll be praying as many prayers as you like, as short of prayers, as long of prayers, it doesn't. It'll be the Spirit, Holy Spirit working through you. But Jess, I spoke to her just uh, the day before she left. She can't take even a Bible into the, in there. They search their bags. If there's any Bibles, they're taken from them. And I shared with her my, uh, my experience at the night before I went into, well, I'll tell you what it is, North Korea. Our leader gave me, I couldn't take a Bible, he gave me this. The Lord is my shepherd. That's relationship. I shall not want. That's supply. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. That's rest. He leadeth me beside still waters. That's refreshment. He restoreth my soul. That's healing. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness. That's guidance. For his name's sake, that's purpose. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's testing. I will fear no evil, that's protection. For thou art with me, that's faithfulness. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, that's discipline. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. That's hope. Thou anointest my head with oil. That's consecration. My cup runneth over. That's abundance. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. That's blessing. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. That's security. Forever. That's eternity. So come, please, and we'll pray that prayer for Jess over and over on Saturday. But please come and join us as a corporate body, which will send... I'm, I'm hoping that Jess is probably uh, watching online. And this will be... If you are, Jess, watching in Singapore there, before you go, with the family, this, this will be for you, that, that we'll get together to commit both you and Peter uplift you, cover you, strengthen you, armour you in prayer. So please come next Saturday morning, 10 o'clock here. Thank you. Come Sahamdidar, I meant to say. That's for the Korean people here. They'll understand that. Thank you very much, it is. Thanks, Colin, for that. And we're going to continue with our prayer at the moment too. In Matthew 6, Jesus teaches a simple and authentic, authentic model prayer that we use as our guideline for praying. The disciples had asked Jesus one morning, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus says, this then is how you should pray. So let's all come together now in prayer. Our God who is in heaven, and all of us here on earth, the hungry, the oppressed, the excluded, holy is your name. In our choice to struggle with the complexities of this world and to confront greed and the desire for power in ourselves, in our nation and in the global community, give us this day our daily bread, bread that we are called to share, bread that you have given us abundantly and that we must distribute fairly, ensuring security and help for all. 
Forgive us our trespasses, times we have turned away from the struggles of other people and countries, times when we have thought only of ourselves. Lead us not into temptation, the temptation to close our minds, our ears, our eyes, to those around us in need of our help, our love, our prayers. The temptation to think it's too difficult or we're too busy. Deliver us from evil, the evil of a world where violence is happening everywhere, from the evil of thinking of excuses to not be involved, where gates and barriers between people are so hard to bring down. May your reign come, for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. song called Amazing Grace, which we're going to sing. I said before about um, how singing is a way for us to connect with God. Sometimes, you know, familiar words it can be easy for us just to read and uh, sing and that doesn't actually engage us. I want to encourage you, really engage with these words. Think about what you're singing. That will be... Uh, for us to take the bread and the cup together. Let's stand, shall we? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears really how precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed my chains are gone I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing. promise good to me his word my hope secures he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures my chains are gone I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, 
His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. The earth shall soon dissolve like snow. The sun forbear to shine, but God who called me here below will be forever mine, will be forever. Bible reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 1 to 17. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but, is, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> wow, call and response. Uh, I'm Reese, if you don't know me, and it's my privilege today. We're going to jump into Romans 8, which is such an amazing chapter. 
Uh, we're sort of in the turning point of Romans where we've come from a lot of sin and death and we're, we're turning into a time of hope. Um, now, let me just say we've moved communion to after the message today, um, for those of you who are going on the run sheet, um, because today we're going to be hearing a bit about the gospel and communion is a pretty good response to that. Um, but before we get into Romans 8, I want to tell you a story. Uh, th- this is something Jacinda told me this week uh, about a colleague. Uh, so one of her colleagues at work uh, is a pretty bogan Aussie woman who's grown up in Australia um, and, and, and so is just a regular Aussie bogan person. Um, <laughs> she, she's recently started spending time with a friend who is Irish. And so she's begun to adopt some of the mannerisms and things that her Irish friend is saying. So she'll be having a conversation and she'll say something like, oh, that's gas, Um, which means uh, that's really funny. Uh, Or she'll be going along and she'll say, that's a crack. Um, And and she's begun to use these Irish terms. This Aussie bogan girl is beginning to seem a little bit Irish. Uh, Her her friend's Irishness is beginning to infect her. But it's gone to such an extent that there is another Irish colleague at work And when this colleague uses those phrases, she apparently uses them wrong. And so the Aussie bogan goes and tells the Irish person how to use the Irish phrases. Um, I I tell this story because I think it illustrates something we all experience. As we spend time with other people, uh, we begin to mimic things that they do. I know there's a group of us young, maybe not so young adults uh, in the church uh, who will often say things like best and true, will say hue, Um, And a whole bunch of different things. We'll say iguana as a meaning of, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, Why? Because we've spent time together. These things have built up and grown over time. We've spent time with each other, and so we begin to copy one another. Today, we're going to look at what Paul is calling being in Christ or being in the Spirit. And this is a similar thing, where we're going, being in Christ and being in the Spirit, over time, we're going to reflect his nature and his character more and more. Uh, We're going to say the things that he would say, uh, act in the ways that he would act. Uh, And now before I get into Romans 8, let me tell you, the Christian life has two elements. One is the moment when we say, I want you, Jesus. This moment of salvation. In that moment, we are safe, we are secure in him. There is also in our lives an aspect of sanctification. This is the journeying on the road to become more and more like him that day by day we begin to reflect the nature of God more. As, my, as Jacinda's friend became more Irish, we become more like God. This idea is sanctification. Uh, and in Romans 8, there's a bit of both of these at play. And as we apply them to our lives, there's a bit of both. Uh, but how about I pray and let's jump in. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the message of your word to us. Our Lord, thank you that uh, today we're going to hear that it's not about what we do, but what you have done. And Lord, that we, if we call upon your name, have your spirit living in us. So Lord, by your spirit, would you be convicting our hearts and minds today? And Lord, if there are some of us here who uh, haven't chosen to follow you, Lord, would you be working as well and revealing the truth and the goodness of your gospel? Uh, Lord, would you speak today? Amen. So we jump into Romans 8 and we're initially hit with the word therefore. Hopefully by now, You know, if we see therefore, we have to think, well, what came beforehand? Uh, So we're going to start Romans 8 by looking back to Romans 7. Uh, Justin spoke last week, and Romans 7 has some of uh, Paul's greatest, uh, most eloquent phrases ever. Uh, He says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. Uh, Now, if I do uh, what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Romans 7 is a passage all about the I, all about me, the experience we have as people. Uh, In a chapter of 480 words, 49 of those words are the personal pronoun I or me or my. This is a chapter all about our experience as human beings. Uh, Closely behind that, we have the word law coming up. Uh, Now, Justin talked about this. This law captures the law God has given to his people. Uh, the, uh, the Ten Commandments, the law throughout the Bible. Um, and Paul is saying here that no matter what I do, I can't follow that law. Uh, but it's, it's further than that. It's not just I can't follow God's law. He says, I do not even do what I want to do. This is the experience we all face. Whether we're Jewish and under the law or not, we do not even live up to the standard that we set ourselves. 
And so in Romans 7, it's a bit of doom and gloom. Our life is something that we cannot escape from. We cannot do good. But when we step into Romans 8, we have a change. Instead of I leading the story, it becomes the Spirit. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit will have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit comes up or the word Christ 23 times in this passage. Here we get to look at what life is like, not by default as us as humans, but in Christ, in Jesus. And as Paul speaks, we're going to find a number of blessings or privileges that we receive being people who are in the Spirit. So perhaps today you're someone who hasn't made a a decision to follow Jesus. I encourage you, listen carefully. These are the blessings that we as Christians hold dear. I believe that these things are true. I've experienced them in my life and I hope I'll experience them more and more as I grow older. And if you're a Christian here, you've heard these things before. Yeah, we, we all know the gospel message, but I ask that you open your heart, that you say to God, reveal something new to me. Well, let me leave this place changed again, refreshed again by your word. Because friends, we can hear the gospel every day of our lives and it will continue to go deeper and deeper into us. So we can finally get into Romans 8. We're going to jump around a bit because Paul is a little bit all over the place in his logic and I'm going to try and make it as clear as possible. So Paul has the idea of the law of sin and death. This is what Romans 7 was about. It is this law God gave his people and it's a good law. He says, if you follow these things, you will live a good life. You will be righteous. You will be good and right with God. And yet Paul says what the law was powerless to do. The law was meant to make us right and good, but it was powerless to do this because it was weakened by our flesh. When Paul uses this word flesh, it's not just our physical body, it's the broken corruption in our nature. What the law was meant to do, it could not achieve because we are broken people. This is what Romans 7 was all about. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. The law that was meant to lead to life for us instead becomes a law of sin and death because we cannot live to God's perfect standard. And so instead of it being a beacon that we're walking towards and we're following, it becomes to us something that condemns us. The law says you have not lived up to this standard. You have not done well in life. You have been corrupt. You have stolen. You have wronged people. You have been broken. Now, I'm going to share a story which is very close uh, to my heart. Uh, It's from when I was very little. Um, Mum had just cooked a a bunch of cookies, uh, and they were in the cookie jar, and I asked if I could have one. And now mum said, no, you can't have one. It was probably before lunch or something and she didn't want to ruin my appetite. But we all know where this is going, right? Because we've all been in the same situation. Mum left the room. I went in, I took one of the cookies. When she came back in, of course, she's my mum. She knows what I've done. She says, did you have a cookie, Reese?" In that moment, I felt such guilt, such embarrassment, that still today, I can feel that feeling of little five or six-year-old Reese. (laughs) And while this is a small little thing that happened years ago that's pretty much inconsequential, we all go through our life doing these things, right? Every day we're stealing cookies and feeling guilty. And what God's perfect law does is it condemns us. Our spirit ourselves says, oh, I've done something wrong here. But God's law also testifies to that. But Paul here today isn't isn't focusing on what we are like in the law. He's not focusing on the Romans 7. He's focusing on what life is like in the spirit. And so let's see what he says. What the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did. What I was unable to do, the perfect life that I was unable to live, God did for me. Friends, this is probably the most simple way of understanding the gospel, that God did what we were unable to do. How did he do it? By sending his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. He was a human being, yet he was only like us in that he didn't sin, yet he was perfect. He was fully human to be a sin offering. 
to die in the place of our sin upon the cross. Why? So that the righteous requirement of the law might be met in us. When we look at the law, the law is good, but we're broken and we can't follow it, so therefore we face condemnation. We have guilt. We have to pay the punishment. It has to be paid. It can't be taken away. And God is just. He's not going to just wash it out. Justice matters to our God. Yet in his mercy, he comes. As Jesus, he lives under the law as the perfect human as we couldn't. And even though he didn't deserve to pay the price, he did. And in dying on the cross, he paid the price for us. And so now we can finally read the first verse of the chapter. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no judgment There is no punishment waiting for you if you are in Christ Jesus. This is the first privilege for those who are in the Spirit. We will not face condemnation, not because God is unjust, but because he has borne it for us. We now face no condemnation. Friends, in the the journey of salvation and sanctification, this is salvation. In the moment we believe, we put our life in Jesus we now face no condemnation. Now, there is probably an element where we go through life and we put to death that guilt more and more and more. But the truth is that if you are in Christ, you will face no condemnation. That guilt you feel, Jesus has taken it away. That punishment is taken away. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for those who are in the Spirit. But let's continue. In this next passage, uh, Paul is concerned with the mind, with how we think as people in the spirit. He says, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Likewise, those who live according to the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Paul is saying here that the second blessing, the second privilege of being in the spirit is that God will change the way we think. Before we knew Christ, our mind thought and desired what the flesh wanted. What does the flesh want? It wants to build up myself. It wants me to look good, to be secure, to be safe. And so I steal, I cheat, I lie, I rob. I'm thinking all about myself. And yet in the spirit, God transforms my mind. Second privilege here is that he renews my mind. Now, most of you have met Kayla. She's... My daughter, she's 11 months, almost a year old. I can't believe it. Um, And she's at a very exciting stage of life. She loves to play and interact. She's just learned to clap and to put her hands up when you tell her to. Um, She's always interacting with things and loving life. But it doesn't matter what you're doing. The very second she sees a phone, nothing else matters. Her mind is set on that phone and she has powered across the room and she's wrestling with you and crying and fighting to get that phone. We don't let her have it, but she tries. It probably makes her want it more. Uh, Same thing, if she sees an open dishwasher, wow, she can move quick. She has moved four meters across the living room and she is there at the dishwasher before you even notice. Uh, And the same thing with cords. Uh, This morning, a guy was looking after her and as soon as she saw uh, his shoelaces, they were undone. The very moment Kayla sees these things, nothing else matters. Her mind is set on getting these things. Well, Paul says, for those who live in accordance with the Spirit will have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The things of the flesh will become less important and our mind will be focused on achieving what the Spirit desires working in us. Now, what does the Spirit desire? I I don't think Paul goes into a lot of detail here. But if you read scripture, you will see what God's heart is. Jesus says, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. These two things sum up all of the law. So if we are to be people of the spirit, this is what our lives will look like. But he does say here, this life governed, the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. So if you are someone whose mind is governed by the spirit, you're going to think about things and experience this deep life and peace in Christ. This is the overflow of no condemnation, right? We don't have to work to earn our salvation. We experience life and peace. But he also says the mindset on the flesh 
won't submit to God's law, and it cannot please God. Well, conversely, the mind set on the things of the spirit is going to actually think, how can I please God? We're going to think, what things can I do that are going to honor God? And now, in the journey of salvation and sanctification, I think this is a bit of a sanctification journey. Yeah, we become a Christian, it's not like suddenly all our old desires disappear, but God working in us gradually puts them to death and helps renew our mind. We are to be people whose mind is set on the things the Spirit desires. And when it says to set our minds upon this, it's an interesting idea because elsewhere in Scripture, Paul says to set your minds upon the things above, not on earthly things. So there is an element of setting our minds that is up to us. It is my responsibility to do things and to set up my life so that I am thinking about the things of God, the things that will please him. That might mean I'm putting away a certain book or I'm changing the shows that I'm watching or maybe I'm taking social media off my phone. I'm taking deliberate steps to set my mind on the things of the spirit. And yet at the same time in this passage, it's clearly also a gift, a blessing of what God is doing in our lives. And friends, this is part of the mystery of the Christian life is that it's not the spirit doing it or not me doing it. It is both of us working together. God's spirit works in me, changing my desires, changing my heart, but I also have a responsibility to act. So if we are in the spirit, we are going to be people who as we go through life will have more and more of a renewed mind. We are going to set our mind on the things of the spirit. Uh, And we continue on. Now, I'm not going to spend long on this part. I wanted to just highlight it. It doesn't really add much to what we're saying here. Uh, But I wanted to caution you. Uh, When you read this part, be careful. I think in the past, I have read it as a question of, do you actually have the spirit of God? Uh, Paul says, you, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. But friends, I don't think Paul's goal here is to make you question whether or not you are saved. We need to be careful when we read this because for Paul to be in Christ is the same thing as to have Christ in you, which is the same thing as to be in the spirit and the same thing to have the spirit in you. So when you read this passage, don't think, oh, maybe I'm not showing enough of the spirit in my life. Maybe I'm not uh, speaking in tongues or all these things. No, Paul's goal here is to strengthen you in your faith. He's not here to go, are you actually saved? Because friends, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus will be saved. For Paul, this is all the same thing. He's saying you are in the realm of the spirit if God lives in you. If you have chosen Jesus, you are in the realm of the spirit. Uh, But let's go on. The third blessing of being in Christ. If Christ is in you, even though your body is subject to death because of sin, we all know we live in a world where we are going to die. We see decay day by day. In, in my life personally, I live with asthma. I have reflux. Uh, I often have really sore and bad shoulders. Um, and I've been dealing with long COVID. And I'm only in my early 30s. Our life is a life where we continue to decay more and more. And one day we will see death. This is a result of the corruption, the brokenness in our world. But the blessing here is that the spirit living in you gives life. So while you will still die in this world, you will be raised again. God will raise your body from the death. Why? Because of righteousness. Now he spoke before, we can't live and fulfill the law. That's something God has to do for us. This is Christ's righteousness. If Christ is in you, he will give life because of his righteousness that he bestows upon you. Paul then says the same thing. If the Spirit's in you, he will raise you again. And he gives a little bit of evidence. He says, because he's raised Christ from the dead. God's already done it. Christ, Jesus raising from the dead is evidence, is the first fruit that one day we will also be raised from the dead. And so friends, as Christians, the third privilege is that we have a great hope. We have an expectation of a future where we will rise again, which means that this world is not all that matters. And friends, our hopes should change the way we live. I've been a teacher for seven years now. Um, 
And around this time every year, uh, there'll be a bunch of Year 12 students who've sent off requests and received early offers of entry into the subjects they want to do. Uh, and receiving this early offer of entry sort of changes the way they go about the next few months. Uh, hopefully, they'll still be studious and be engaging and trying to learn and whatnot. Uh, but receiving this early offer of entry means I don't need to stress myself about every single mark. Maybe I can go out with my friends tonight and have some fun. And so receiving this new hope, instead of looking to, I hope I get a good ATAR, it's, oh, I'm actually getting into this subject, it changes the way they live. They live now with more freedom and hope and joy, hopefully. Um, in the same way, this hope that we have of the future should change the way we live now. Yeah, it's this hope that has enabled Christians throughout history to go to the point of death for their faith. Why? Because they're going to be raised again. This world is not their home. It is for this reason that people like Mother Teresa have given up everything to go into a life of caring for those that society does not care for. Why? Because we don't need to build a kingdom here. Our hope is in the future when we are raised and we are in the presence of God again. This is why people can go to countries like Korea and the place where Jess is going and risk it all because there is a greater hope ahead of them. As Christians, as those living in the spirit, we have a great hope. And friends, I, I want to challenge you. If you're someone who's lived with this great hope for a long time, how has it changed your life? And don't worry, this is part of sanctification. It's going to continue to, as the Spirit lives and dwells in you, change more and more. As you live today, maybe is there some way that you want to change your life so that this hope is more real, more clear? Is there something you're holding on to you need to give away? It, maybe you don't need to work five days a week. Maybe you can drop down to three. And on those other days, you can give your time to those who need it. I, I don't know what it is. But friends, let us be people as Christians, as those in the spirit whose hope drives our actions. And then we get to the end of Romans or of this section. Paul says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Here we have our fourth privilege. It doesn't sound much of a privilege though, does it? We have an obligation. This is a duty, a responsibility. We're expected to act. It's not exactly what I would list on a list of privileges. We're expected to act in a way we're putting to death the misdeeds of the body. We're, starting, we're trying to live not in the way of Romans 7, where we're doing what we do not want to do. We're putting that to death and living more and more like God. And I think this is a gradual process. This is part of sanctification. And why do we have this duty? Well, Paul starts with therefore. It's because of what came before. We have an obligation, a duty, because we are now not under condemnation. Because God is renewing our mind, because we have a great hope in the future, now we have a responsibility to live in a way that honours God, live in the way of the Spirit alive in us. If we keep reading, there's also another reason why we're to live like this. And you could probably say this is a fifth blessing. If you want a fifth blessing, you can keep that in your mind. Paul says, those who led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who have the Spirit of God are the children of God. We are adopted. We can cry out, Abba, Father. Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father in heaven. We are children. We are heirs. Paul says, while God could have chosen any other uh, form of relationship to interact with us in, while he could have seen us as master and slave, there is no connection, no love there, Paul didn't, uh, God didn't want to act that way towards us. God doesn't treat us as slaves. He adopts us as his children. God chose an intimate relationship with us. And I want to spend more time here, uh, but I'm going to move on. Tom is, I believe, in communion going to touch on this. If he doesn't, it's not his fault. Um, <laughs> but we're told here that we are children of God. We have a new identity. And this identity is now and into the future. We are children of God. So we have a duty because we have no condemnation. We have a renewed mind. We have a great hope, but because we are children of God as well. I'm, I apologize. I'm going to use two illustrations of me being a father. I won't use any next time. Um, but 
as you know, I'm a dad. This is my beautiful girl. Um, I, I am her dad, and I therefore have a duty or an obligation to look after her, to care for her, uh, to introduce her to the things of the world and the things of God, uh, to be there when she walks down the aisle, to help her as she goes to school and learns, as she faces difficulties in her life. I have this duty. But I look at that duty and it's not something that's hard or I, I don't want to do. It probably is hard. It's not something I'm scared of or, or wanting to avoid. It's not like I'm going to work in a factory and it's this monotonous hard duty work. This is a obligation, a duty which comes from joy. Yeah? I want to see her do open, shut them. I want to teach her to do that. I want to be there as she grows up. I have an obligation, a duty to her. Friends, we have the same type of duty in our relationship with God. We have an obligation, but it's not a heavy burden. It is something that frees us. Paul says that if we live this way, we will find life. Now, let me clarify. We are not saved by our works. We are saved by what Christ has done. Paul previously said, if Christ is in you, and you, your life is in Christ, he who raised him from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. We're not saved by our work, but our obligation to live in a certain way to honor God, if we live that out, we are going to feel fullness of life. Yeah, I could choose not to be involved in Kayla's life, but my life would be empty and darker because of it. We have a duty as those who follow Jesus to live in a way that honors him. And if we do, we will find fullness of life. There is joy in our duty to God. And so this duty isn't a hard, harsh, difficult thing to do. It is a wonderful duty. I'm not saying there won't be days where it's difficult. We will share in his sufferings, but it is a wonderful duty. It is a joyful duty that we have. So friends, as we live our lives, let us, like Jacinda's friend, spending time with her Irish friend and becoming Irish, let us, as we are in the spirit, become more and more like him. If you're not someone who's put your hope in God, in, in Jesus, let me encourage you. There is no condemnation in him. The guilt that you might feel in your day-to-day -day life, you need not feel it. With him, there is peace. He has paid that price. And as those who live in him, I can testify that these are blessings that he bestows upon us. By no means am I already, already there completely. There's a lot of renewing of my mind, a lot more of that wonderful duty to be birthed in me. But there is joy to be found here. There is freedom found here. And for those of you who are in the spirit, leave today knowing that there is now no condemnation for you. You in Christ can find peace. You don't need to work to earn your salvation and your identity. It is given to you by Christ who died on your behalf. And friends, leave today setting your mind on the things of the spirit and not the things of this world. Trusting in him, seeking to honor him in your thoughts and your actions. Look ahead to that future hope. Meditate on it, think about it day after day and let it permeate the way you live here so that you don't live with fear. You don't see this world as your kingdom, but the future world as the place that matters. And friends, go today knowing that you have been given a wonderful duty. Your responsibility to act in response is not a burden. It is a privilege. It is a blessing from God and something that will bring fullness of life to you. But friends, I spent a lot of time talking about these blessings. The greatest blessing of them all is this, that we are in the spirit, that we are in intimate relationship with God himself. Leave today knowing that he is with you no matter where you go, that Christ is living in you, that his spirit is moving in you. Ask him to transform you, to change your heart, to strengthen and be with you because no matter where you go, he will be with you to the very end of the age. Friends, let us be people who are living lives in the spirit. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the good news. We thank you for the message that you give us through your word that 
we don't need to measure up. We don't need to earn our salvation and our identity. But Lord, you have done that for us. It was costly. It cost your life. And yet you were greater. You rose again. So Lord, let us be people who daily are turning our minds upon you. Lord, remembering that we need face no condemnation. We need fear not, but we can find peace in you. Lord, would you continue to work in us to renew our minds? Help us to fix our eyes upon the future hope we have. And Lord, help us to live out the joy of that duty you have given to us. Father, we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you that we have found in you, in your spirit. Amen. Thanks, Reese. That was, uh, yeah, really encouraging. Really cool kind of message about um, who we are and how we're found. And I did, did want to um, just focus on one aspect of that uh, chapter, all about being heirs, heirs of Christ. Uh, now, one of my favorite um, characters from The Simpsons is Mr. Burns. I don't know if anyone here has watched The Simpsons before. Um, but uh, he's, he's probably the oldest, oldest guy in Springfield and the richest guy in Springfield. And uh, one of my favorite episodes is um, he, realizes he ha- realizes he has no children or any uh, descendants and he could die soon. So... <laughs> He wants to um, leave his inheritance to someone. He wants to appoint an heir. So he puts out a, a sort of an audition for the young boys of Springfield. And eventually Bart uh, becomes the heir to Mr. Burns' vast fortune. Um, and as part of that, he gets to go to Mr. Burns' house and experience all the riches he has there. He's got this humongous TV they watch cartoons on. He's got, uh, you can hire like any, food, any, any celebrity to come and bring food to you. Um, he even gets to help Mr. Burns firing people at the power plant. Um, and a- as this goes on, Bart kind of realizes that maybe Mr. Burns isn't the most, uh, I don't know, nice kind of guy to actually be involved with here, um, particularly as he's given an ultimatum to disown his previous family um, or just become Mr. Burns' sole heir. And so Bart eventually chooses to uh, go back to his old family. And um, yeah, that's the story. Um, in normal life, we don't usually get to become, you know, benef- beneficiaries of a billionaire in the town. Um, but uh, we often do get to face this inheritance question with our parents. Um, and when they move on, when they die, um, we get to become heirs of them. So uh, it's something that I haven't faced yet, but maybe people have faced here. And um, there's a lot that goes into that. Um, but some people also get to have their inheritance come early. So parents might give their inheritance um, while they're still alive so they can see their kids enjoy their inheritance. Um, this means, though, that when they do pass on, that you won't get uh, as big an inheritance or maybe nothing at all because you've had it early. So what does this all have to do with communion, you might ask? Well, the cross, the cross actually gives us a way to have our cake and eat it too in some ways. Um, so, because of what Jesus did through the cross, we get to see in Romans 8, as we just heard about, that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we're children, then we're heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. So, not only do we get to become heirs of the God of the universe to inherit his kingdom one day, but we get to participate in his kingdom now through Christ. It's not a thing of of Christ as as God's promised us this inheritance and we just have to kind of suffer in this world apart from him. But because Christ actually came to the world, died as a man and rose again, we get to now experience the kingdom coming to earth. I mean, sadly for some people, maybe people who aren't Christians, especially, the offer is not a big sum of money or some beautiful Sydney side, you know, uh, land or apartment here, which is going to increase in value. Um, But it's actually life and freedom that's available to us. Um, It's in, in our sufferings now, similar to the sufferings that Christ endured, 
We're assured that Christ is with us. And in our life to come, we're given full access to God, full access to the Father with no suffering or pain. So we're going to take up communion now and ask the helpers to come down and start to distribute um, the cups and juice um, and bread. Um, But I just want to sort of leave you with this thought to consider as we take communion, as we consider what Christ has done, that he took on suffering, that he took on death and conquered it for us. When you think about the world, if you're someone who usually focuses on the future, heaven, what it's going to be like in heaven with uh, all the blessing inheritance to come, it's going to be no more suffering, no more pain. Or if you're someone who focuses a lot more on the day-to-day and how Christ is with us now, be assured that because of this death and resurrection, it enables, <laughs> Christ enables both these things to be a reality. We can both remember who, what he did for us. And now that we get to experience the kingdom now, we get to reign with Christ as co-heirs, and yet we will also reign in heaven with him. Uh, as God reigns, we will be um, inheriting that. Um, and I think that's just a really important and powerful part of communion that we get to experience both the now and yet to come, not just one or the other. Uh, so let me just pray and uh, take, take communion in your own time. Uh, Lord God, we thank you so much for the inheritance that you've blessed upon us. God, we thank you that we are made heirs and co-heirs with Christ. We're not slaves. We're not subject to just toil and, and, and be under, under something that is not uh, a relationship, as Reese said, but you give us relationship through your son dying on the cross. We remember now what you have done for us, Lord. And help us to consider both the now and yet to come, how we can have life to the full despite suffering with you now. And we will also experience eternal life with you. No more suffering, no more pain. Thank you, Jesus. song helps us to remember the firm foundation on which we stand. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus Cause He's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would He fail now? He won't He won't I still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense 
So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I've built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't He won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail. built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through oh rain came wind blew but my house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, but everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down, he's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. He won't, he won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't fail, he won't fail, no he won't. We go into our world encouraged that our God is a God who will not fail. Friends, if you are in Christ, there is now no condemnation upon you. Your guilt is washed clean. Your sin is taken away. Christ has borne that for you upon the cross. So go this week in peace, knowing that He is with you and He is for you. Friends, as you step into this week, set your minds upon the things of the Spirit deliberately make choices to glorify Him in your thoughts and set your mind on the things to come, on the day of resurrection where we see Him face to face and let your life be transformed as you seek to live out this wonderful obligation we have to Him, this joyful duty He's given to us to live as the children of God. Friends, go this week knowing that His Spirit is upon you. But if you trust in Jesus, He is with you to the very end of the age. He will not fail. There is no condemnation upon you. Amen. So thank you for joining us today, friends. Um, Graham is down here because he has on his heart to pray for people. Uh, if something was stirred in you during that time, please come down. He's down here, a uh, beautiful looking man. Uh, come down, he will love to pray for you. Um, and otherwise, please join us for morning tea or one of the many meetings if you're involved in that. Otherwise, have a great week. And may God's peace be with you. Thank you. <laughs> True.